Welcome back. In this section, I'm going to discuss the methods that we use in valuation. I'll talk about the basic rule of valuation, and then I'll introduce market multiples valuation, which is one of the most fundamental techniques you need to be familiar with. So I'll talk about how we use it, when we use it, and what we should be aware of when we use it. Okay, so let's start off with the point of equity valuation. I think everyone kind of understands this already, but generally we want to know what assets are undervalued and what assets are overvalued. So we have this very straightforward rule. If the market price or the market value of an asset is less than our intrinsic value or fair value, then we want to buy that asset. If our market value is greater than the underlying intrinsic value, then, well, if we own shares of that, we want to sell those shares. Or if we don't own shares, we might want to short those shares. Okay, so ultimately, if our valuation is correct, which we hope it is, then investment in some undervalued asset is going to lead to what we say positive alpha. So remember what we talked about with the CAFM, we had this alpha. Uh, that alpha is a measure of outperformance given the risk of the asset in question. So if we've done this right and we have valued this asset appropriately, we should end up with a positive alpha, meaning we beat the market. Okay, so what determines an asset's value? Quite frankly, the intrinsic value. Uh, the intrinsic value is the present value of that asset to the investor. And we generally calculate the intrinsic value using three big components. Uh, the first one is the future cash flows that it, the asset can generate. Pretty straightforward. Uh, these will be in the form of Oh, sometimes dividends, sometimes free cash flows to the firm or the equity. Uh, whatever they are, they're the cash flows that this asset will kick off in the future. We also want to know the discount rate necessary to receive those cash flows. So if we're taking on this really risky asset or we're buying this risky asset, quite frankly, that discount rate needs to proxy for the risk of the asset. So some really, really high risk emerging market stock is going to have a high discount rate. Other, dis other stocks like Apple are going to have a lower discount rate. And then we're not going to be completely accurate when we estimate our free cash flows. So we often adjust our discount rate upward if we think our cash flow risk is very, very high. Uh, now, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use historical data and other estimates to try and predict our future free cash flows and our discount rate. But ultimately, the things that determine uh, most assets value are the free cash flows and the discount rates and the, the risk of those cash flows. Okay, so I have here a list of very common valuation techniques. So like I said, we're starting out with market multiples here. Market multiples is very, very popular. It's very simple, and it's actually one of the few methods that don't require you to estimate future cash flows. That's why we're starting with it. Uh, market multiples is very popular when you're valuing an IPO or a tech firm that has a really high growth rate, but there are other methods out there. We won't talk about transaction multiples in this class uh, too much. We might mention it briefly, but uh, I'm going to put it by the wayside. Replacement cost or asset value method, we'll talk about that very, very briefly in the next video. Uh, we also have things like the residual income model you'll see in portfolio management, and then a couple of these other models are more complicated. So the DDM is something you saw in 300, but a very, very modified form of the uh, discounted cash flows model, say the two-stage DCF or the three-stage DCF, these are kind of like the Cadillac models. Like the, These are the best models if you have complete or close to complete data. They're personally my favorite models for using when valuing a firm. Okay, so, let, so let's talk about the market multiples method. So this is a method where we assume a firm has the same growth prospects as its direct competitors. Uh, the most important part of this method is finding one ideal competitor firm. If you don't find that ideal competitor or this firm is very, very unique and it's not got any good competitors, this model completely breaks down. So what I want you to take away from this model is that the most important part is finding a direct competitor that does everything that your firm is doing. 
what we do is we multiply the statistic of our target firm, say the firm we're trying to value, by the competitor's corresponding valuation ratio. So we'll talk about that in a second, but basically what we're doing here is we've got the statistic for our firm we're trying to value, and we're copying on the growth prospects of our competitor firm using their valuation ratio. Benefit here, we're not relying on estimates of free cash flows in the future. It's very, very simplistic. It's very, very useful in that regard. Okay, so let's talk about how we actually use market multiples. Like I said, it's just two numbers multiplied by each other. So if we're trying to value a target, let's say it's Apple, we might take Apple's earnings per share and multiply that by a corresponding valuation ratio that has their competitor's earnings per share in the denominator. So if Apple's competitor is Google, we'd multiply Apple's EPS by Google's PE ratio. And what we're really doing here is copying on the growth prospects of Google using their PE ratio onto Apple's earnings per share. The intrinsic value here tells us essentially what Apple should be worth if it had the exact same growth prospects of Google. All right, so how do we actually use market multiples? Well, here's some pretty common calculations using market multiples. If we have sales per share of a target firm, we might take price to sales of their competitor. If we have book price per share of the target firm, we might take price to book, uh, price to, let's say we have the operating cash flow or OCF of the target, we might take price to operating cash flow per share. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that we can do here. Uh, the key here is that whatever is you know, our target value firm's valuation metric, we want to have that same metric in the denominator of the valuation ratio. Okay, so what issues do we have? Well, like I said, the most important consideration here is the comparable firm. If your firm does not have a comparable firm, this method is garbage. Do not use this method. Other issues. Well, if there's a huge amount of earnings management going on, you know, the firm is manipulating its earnings per share. Uh, well, in that case, our valuation ratio is probably not going to work because we're, we might be using earnings per share of our target firm. Uh, different firms are going to have different choices in gaps, say maybe using LIFO or the FIFO method. Uh, that can throw this method, this valuation technique off. And then also different firms are going to have different, different fiscal years. Uh, they also might see different fluctuations in the business cycle. So all of these things are going to throw off our valuation. So ultimately, this method, like a lot of valuation methods, it is a pretty straightforward calculation, but there is a large amount of judgment that goes into this method. Usually what I would say is that, you know, you want to make sure this is an appropriate method. And then when you use this method, you want to have a large number of market multiple valuations. So it's not just one particular statistic. It might be four or six different uh, intrinsic values that you're using. And then have a good sense of which ones are probably the most accurate, uh, which ones are probably the least accurate. You might even take a mean. Okay, so let's go ahead and try a CFA question. So you're valuing a security which is actively traded and followed by many analysts. Based on your model, you arrive at an intrinsic value which is much lower than current market prices. The sensible course of action will be to A, reevaluate your model, B, place a large buy order, or C, place a large sell order. Well, quite frankly, uh, the key here is going to be the fact that this is actively traded and followed my, by many analysts. Usually, if a firm is being heavily scrutinized by a lot of analysts, say like Apple or Google, chances are that firm's valuation is very, very close to its intrinsic value, or its price is close to its intrinsic value. So if you're getting something that's way off, generally the first thing we would want to do is reevaluate our model. Is our model accurate? You know, the, the wisdom of the crowd, you know, there is some value in that, although what I've tended to find is that if you've built a good valuation model, you're probably more right than the crowd. Okay, so let's try a very basic market multiples valuation. So I have here two firms, Starbucks and McDonald's. And uh, notice here that I've got a lot of their valuation ratios, and I've got a lot of their corresponding statistics. 
down here, the SIC code, for both of these firms, it's the same. They're essentially in the retail beverage and food market. So they, they obviously sell uh, fast food or you know something akin to fast food in the case of Starbucks. Uh, believe it or not, Starbucks is seen as McDonald's closest direct competitor and vice versa if we go off return correlation. So they have the, uh, the things that drive McDonald's share price are most likely to affect Starbucks as opposed to say like, oh, some other company's share price. Also, they have the same SIC code, which tells us these are probably pretty decent competitors. So let's go ahead and value Starbucks using McDonald's information. So let's start off with the valuation based on the trailing PE ratio. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take the trailing earnings per share of Starbucks, and we're going to multiply that by McDonald's trailing PE ratio. It's literally as simple as that. So... Starbucks, their intrinsic value is $94.66 using this method. Uh, if I use the forward PE ratio, I'd take the expected earnings per share of Starbucks, multiply that by the forward PE ratio of McDonald's. There we go. Uh, same thing for the price to book or market to book. Uh, notice here, though, I've got some blanks. What does this mean? Well, what this means is that we have a negative book price per share for both of these firms, which you can see down here. I mean, the book price per share of Starbucks and McDonald's are both negative. Now, the rule with uh, reporting some of these valuation ratios is that if you calculate a negative, you just put a dash. So, quite frankly, we can't use this method. We don't, I mean, I mean, I guess technically we could try and multiply this, but you just get a you know, nothing. Okay, finally, we have the price to sales ratio. And the benefit of this one is that you can never have a, a negative here. Uh, you can't have negative sales. Uh, I guess maybe technically you can if you have like uh, returns, but yeah, that's neither here nor there. Okay, so using this method, uh, we've got a an intrinsic value of 272. Okay, so taken together, we've got four valuations here. Uh, you know, two of them are pretty darn close. Sales per share, very, very high. Uh, so let's actually take a look at the share price of Starbucks. Here we are. So the data that I just collected was all the, the most recent data that I could get. The current share price is 91.32, so we're actually not that far off using a couple of these valuations. Uh, Generally, when you have an outlier like the uh, price to sales ratio had, so it was 272, this would give me pause and make me wonder what the heck is going on. Uh, I would obviously want to check my numbers, make sure they're accurate, but uh, quite frankly, uh, when you have outliers, I tend to just drop off the highest and the lowest outlier in a lot of cases because you never know what might be going on. There may be some uh, uh, you know, unexpected event that was taken into account with their sales, maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, there could be a lot of things going on. Uh, I tend to trust a median or, a, uh, you know, something close to a mean when I use this method. Uh, but, you know, as you can see, $94, $95, pretty darn close to the current share price of about 91 bucks. Okay, so let's recap. Our goal in valuation is to identify undervalued and overvalued securities. If we can identify these, we can generate a positive alpha. The market multiples approach is the best method when you can't estimate future cash flows. So these would be like tech firms or IPO firms. And then finally, the most important factor in market multiples is the comparable firm. If you don't have a good competitor to use, do not use the market multiples method. And you can determine whether a firm is a decent competitor by looking at their SIC code or NAICS code or return correlation. You know, generally you want to, you know, do a little more analysis than that, but that's, you know, that's a starting point. So with that, I'm going to bring this video to an end, and if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. Thank you.